Imagine standing at the edge of a scorched canyon, gazing up at a colossal wall of concrete that seems to hold the earth at bay. This is Hoover Dam, a monumental arch 726 feet tall and 1,244 feet long, built in the 1930s amid the Great Depression. It was hailed as one of America's greatest engineering wonders, taming the wild Colorado River to create Lake Mead, a reservoir so vast it captured trillions of gallons of water and became a lifeline for 25 million people. In this video, Construction Wars dives into the Hoover Dam story, from desperate need to daring construction, and finally to its modern day challenges. We'll see, why was this dam built in the first place? How did engineers defy the laws of nature to build it during the darkest days of the Great Depression? And is this giant concrete colossus on the brink of failing us? But before that smash that like button, subscribe to Construction Wars, and ring the bell. Also tell us in the comment section which mega project we should cover in our next episode. At the turn of the 20th century, the Colorado River was a wild beast. Floods swept away farms and towns. In 1905 alone, the river burst its banks and drowned entire communities in California's Imperial Valley. Farmers desperately diverted water through shaky canals, but one big flood after another washed them out. Meanwhile, burgeoning cities and arid farms on both sides of the river begged for power and irrigation. Leaders realized the only solution was to harness the river. Taming this untamed river meant protecting crops from ruin, powering homes with hydroelectricity, and supplying reliable water to the growing Southwest. By 1928, Congress approved the Boulder Canyon Project and plans were laid for what would become the Hoover Dam. This dam would not only stop devastating floods, but also irrigate roughly 2 million acres of desert farmland and light up cities. Breaking ground in 1931, the Hoover Dam Project became a beacon of hope during the Great Depression. More than 5,000 workers streamed into the Black Canyon of the Colorado to earn pay, living in a new town called Boulder City. Fun fact, Boulder City banned gambling and alcohol for decades as a workplace rule. Engineering chief Frank Crow famously had just seven years to finish this gargantuan task, otherwise the government would hit him with fines of $3,000 per day. His dedication earned him the nickname Hurry Up Crow. Under his leadership, the team tackled one problem after another. First, they had to divert the Colorado River around the site. Four massive tunnels, two on each side of the canyon, were drilled into the canyon walls, each wide enough to fit a four-story building. Explosions and jackhammers echoed as workers blasted through solid rock. High above, men dangled on ropes, high scalers, to chip loose fragments, a deadly job where a single mistake meant certain death. Tragically, 96 men lost their lives building the dam. Yet, despite the dangers, Crow's team finished the diversion tunnels ahead of schedule by using efficient rock drills on wheels that could bore dozens of holes at once. With the river rerouted, huge earthen coffer dams were erected upstream and downstream to hold back the water. This created a dry two-kilometer stretch of riverbed where work could finally begin. But even then, centuries of sediment had left up to 40 meters of mud at the bottom. Workers excavated that silt to reach solid bedrock, about the height of a 12-story building down. Only when the foundation was rock solid could they pour the dam's concrete. The Hoover Dam's design is a lesson in physics. Instead of a straight wall, engineers built it as an arched concrete leviathan. This arch shape was genius. Water pressure pushes against it, but the force is transferred into the canyon walls, making the structure naturally stronger the more the reservoir pushes on it. At its base, the dam is a whopping 660 feet thick, almost three football fields, tapering to 45 feet thick at the top. The result is a low center of gravity, like a pyramid, that anchors the dam solidly to the canyon. There was a catch. If they poured all that concrete at once, it would overheat and crack from inside. So Crow had a bold idea. Pour the dam in blocks and run water through pipes embedded inside to cool each section before continuing. Amazingly, the dam even keeps curing today. Its concrete still hardens over time, meaning Hoover Dam has only gotten stronger since 1936. Once the walls went up, crews built an aerial cableway, strung from Nevada to Arizona. 
Giant buckets carried six cubic meters of concrete to just the right spots. They laid 600 miles of cooling pipes within the dam's blocks and constantly sprayed the fresh concrete with water to keep it from cracking. By September 30th, 1935, the dam was complete and President Herbert Hoover flung a silver switch to commemorate it. Behind Hoover Dam are 17 towering intake towers, each 380 feet tall, funneling Colorado River water down huge shafts to 17 turbines in the power plant below. When full, these turbines could generate 2,080 megawatts, roughly as much as a large nuclear plant. That's enough to power over 1.3 million homes. For the first time, abundant electrical power and irrigation flowed to Los Angeles, Phoenix, Las Vegas, and farms across the Southwest. Las Vegas in particular took off. A small desert town of 8,000 people in the 1930s has now grown past 660,000, largely thanks to that guaranteed water and power from Lake Mead. All the dam's original goals were met. It prevented floods, provided steady irrigation, and created a record-breaking hydropower plant. In fact, Hoover Dam was so iconic that in 1994, it was named one of America's seven modern civil engineering wonders. Every year, some seven million visitors come to marvel at the dam and its reservoir. Yet gigantic as it was, taming the Colorado River came at a cost to nature. Before Hoover, the river flooded seasonally, bringing silt to farmlands and nourishing riparian habitats downstream. Hoover Dam essentially turned that old flow on and off. Wetlands that once stretched for thousands of miles in Mexico began to vanish when Lake Mead trapped all the sediment. Scientists say four native fish species were pushed to the brink of extinction because their breeding cycles depended on natural floods. Even an ancient ancestral Pueblo settlement, the Lost City, was submerged forever as the reservoir filled. On the flip side, Lake Mead created new life. The constant waters gave rise to lakeshore wetlands and a new ecosystem with different fish and wildlife. It became a recreation hotspot, boating, fishing, and beaches, with millions flocking to this blue lake in the desert. By the 1930s, the Southwest cities could boom. Phoenix and Las Vegas in particular, helped along by Hoover's water and power. For nearly 90 years, Hoover Dam delivered water and power on schedule. But now, climate change and human demand have kicked in. Lake Mead's water level has been falling for decades. By 2022, the lake had dropped 50 meters below full pool, a bathtub ring marking just 27% capacity. At that depth, Hoover is producing 40% less electricity than at its peak. In 2023, it was generating only about half the power it did back in 2000. Why? The Southwest has endured the worst mega drought in 1,200 years. Less snowmelt in the Rockies and higher temperatures mean far less inflow to Lake Mead than its designers ever imagined. Moreover, population growth has increased demand. Cities like Phoenix and Las Vegas now draw heavily from the Colorado. Las Vegas alone gets 90% of its drinking water from Lake Mead. If the lake drops just 18 more meters, two of Hoover's four intake towers will sit above water and cannot be used. That's a scary scenario. Imagine cutting off almost all of Vegas's water supply by the tap. Communities and governments aren't standing idle. In Nevada, authorities spent over $800 million on a new deep water intake tunnel that sits far below the old ones. This third straw tunnel ensures Southern Nevada can still draw water even if Lake Mead plunges. Arizona has been storing excess Colorado River water in underground aquifers, tens of billions of gallons for a dry day emergency. California, too, is ramping up recycling and conservation measures. On the policy side, the lower Colorado Basin states agreed in 2019 and 2024 to leave more water in Lake Mead whenever possible, over 3.0 million acre feet saved by 2026. The Bureau of Reclamation is also considering technical fixes. Experts warn that if Lake Mead falls another 20 feet, Hoover's older turbines, the ones designed for high reservoir levels, would have to shut down, cutting the dam's power output by 70%. 
To prevent that, the agency is examining replacing those turbines with new low-head units, a project estimated to cost around $156 million. Meanwhile, five newer turbines, added a decade ago, can keep running even as the water falls towards 950 feet. In short, Hoover Dam remains enormously capable, but its future depends on cooperation and adaptation. The dam itself is still rock solid. The real question now is whether there will be enough water left in Lake Mead for it to hold. The Hoover Dam story is a true saga of American engineering. It reshaped a landscape, transformed economies, and still stands proud 90 years later. Yet, as we've seen, the challenges of today, climate, growth, resource limits, are different from those of the 1930s. Our generation must decide how to honor that legacy. Can we manage our rivers and cities so that this 726-foot concrete giant continues to serve us? What do you think is the next frontier for mega engineering? Should we build smarter, adapt this dam for a drier future, or look for entirely new solutions? Drop your thoughts in the comments below. I read every one. If you enjoyed this deep dive into America's greatest engineering marvel, smash that like button and share this video with fellow history buffs and engineering geeks. Construction Wars signing off.